Okay, I guess we're going to begin here. Um, can you all hear me? Can someone type something in the chat window there? Okay, excellent. Glad that so many of you are uh, have some free time today to attend the lecture here. So this is lecture number 11, uh, 313 Signals and Systems here. And hopefully you can see the slides here. So the announcements, homework six is now due. Unfortunately, it is now going to be due on uh, Tuesday at the beginning of class. Uh, that said, I hope that you all have actually uh, completed the homework because you need to get started on the next one. And uh, unfortunately, quiz number six, uh, I guess you won't be taking because there's a class. Whoops. Okay. Sorry, I've got to configure my screen a little bit here. Let's see. Put that up there. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is uh, what we're going to cover today. So we're going to talk about um, eigenfunctions of LTI systems. So you should be able to explain what is the concept of an eigenfunction and then explain how this uh, function actually is useful. In particular, it's going to be used to simplify uh, convolution. And it's also going to motivate the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. And that brings us into the second topic, which is an introduction into the Fourier series. And so you should be able to explain the key idea of the Fourier series representation and its specializations to real signals. And then finally, you should be able to find the Fourier series coefficients of a given signal. And here I'm going to go through a particular derivation that's um, it's in the book, but it's not uh, highlighted quite the same way. And there's going to be an important concept of orthogonality that comes up. And you should be able to use this orthogonality concept and derive the, uh, and use the analysis and the synthesis equations. Now, let's look at um, what happened here. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm clicking the wrong button here. Okay, I'm going to go that button. Okay. Eigenfunctions of LTI systems. So LTI systems, as we already know, linear time invariant systems, are characterized by their impulse response. And so this means that you can compute the output by the convolution of the input and the impulse response. And we use this little um, star here. Let me get the pin here. We use this little star to denote convolution. And Certain special functions called eigenfunctions pass through almost untouched by the convolution. And so we'll see what that means now. So in eigenfunctions, let's first of all look at continuous time LTI systems. So it turns out that the eigenfunctions of a continuous time LTI system are uh, sinusoids, complex sinusoids, where the input is, whoops, I'm kind of getting rid of this here. It's uh, e to the e to the a t, or sorry, e to the alpha t, where alpha is uh, some complex number. And note that um, there's no unit step function here. So this is a um, infinite duration complex sinusoid. And if you put that infinite duration complex sinusoid into the LTI system, then what happens is you get out um, that same sinusoid here. Let me just change the resolution here. You get out that same sinusoid um, multiplied by some number. And so effectively, an eigenfunction is a, it, it's, it's a function that it goes into the system and it comes back out of the system, possibly scaled and phase shifted. And so eigen comes from the German word, which means own. And so it's, it's a sense that the function, it's a function of the system it, itself here. And it's con attenuated and scaled according to H of alpha, which is often called the system response, and in some special cases is the frequency response that we will see later in the course. Now, the nice thing to notice is that with, um, if you put an eigenfunction into an LTI system, you don't have to do any convolution. All you have to do is figure out the alpha, the h of alpha here. 
right? Because if you know the H of alpha and you know what alpha is, then you can compute the output. Okay, so why, why complex exponentials? Well, let's go through this from first principles looking at the convolution. So suppose I want to convolve the impulse response with some exponential, let's call it e to the st here. Uh, so I'm going to integrate of h of tau with respect to e to the s of t minus tau d tau. And you see here, I can pull the e to the st out and I'm left with the integral of h of tau e to the minus s tau d tau. And that quantity there is what we define as this h of s here or this system response right here. And so this system response is computed by taking the impulse response and integrating it with respect to complex exponential. And note that this, is a, this integral is a function of s here. And so once you've done this once, you can plug in any of your other favorite values in here and you're done. Okay, so that's the, um, the general principle here. So let me just, sorry, let me go back one slide here just to summarize again that um, if you put in complex exponential, it passes basically through the convolution. So here's e to the st, and then e to the st was at the input, and the output, all we see is um, the output e to the st times h of s here. Okay, now I want to talk about um, one specialization uh, of the LTI systems, which are those described by a linear constant coefficient uh, differential equation. So remember that, you know, if I take the nth derivative of e to the st, that's equal to s of n times e to the st here. All right, so you keep taking derivative of the exponential function, you're going to get s of n here. And if I have a LTI system described by a linear constant coefficient differential equation, because it's LTI, I know that, uh, and I put this exponential in, I know that the output will be e to the st times some h of s. So if we insert this e to the st into the differential equation, now we're not considering any boundary effects here. So we're just plugging in this infinite length e to the st, and we use this result of the derivative, what you get is down here. So I get h of s, uh, sorry here, I'm screwing up the, the screen for some reason here, but um, let me go back and come back again here. Okay, so if you look at here, so the input and output are related through this, um, the standard linear constant coefficient differential equation up here. And we know that the input is e to the st. And using this property up here, we can write the right-hand side as e to the st times the sum from k equals 0 to m of bk times s to the power of k. Now, the left-hand side, we have y of t, but we already know that y of t is equal to h of s times e to the st. So we put that up here, and using, again, that same differential uh, formula, we get that h s times e to the st is equal to the sum from k 0 to n, a k s to the k. Now, notice that we have e to the st on both sides. So this and this they're going to cancel. And then we're going to take this here, and we're going to move it over here. And that gives us this equation here. So if you have a LTI system described by a linear constant coefficient differential equation, and you know the coefficients of that equation, then you can compute this transfer function, h of s. And it has a very simple form, which is a function of just the coefficients of that differential equation. Now, if anyone has a question, they can type something in the chat room. In theory, I may be able to 
pass control of the microphone to you, maybe. All right, so let's keep going here. Now, let's look at the eigenfunctions of a discrete time LTI system. Well, for a discrete time LTI system, the form is a little bit different here. So consider the x of n, which is equal to z to the n. So z is a complex number. And this is, um, you know, it looks like the roots that we've already been looking at for discrete time uh, differential equa difference equations. So let's put this z to the n in. What we get at the output is h of z times z to the n, where z to the n is the eigenfunction and h of z is the eigenvalue, or the system response, or the frequency response. And we're going to see later that this is related to the z transform of the impulse response. So just like in the continuous time case, in the discrete time case, LTI systems also have eigenfunctions. But in discrete time, the eigenfunctions are exponentials of the form z to the n instead of exponentials of the form e to the st. So the, it's a different sort of an exponential function here. And we have the same benefits as, benefits as before in that it's easy to convolve the output, the input, and the system to create the output. Now let's look again here at the derivation. So, you know, uh, why here are complex exponentials special? Well, if we look at the convolution, we start off on the first step here. So I'm going to leave h of k in the, um, I'm, and then I'm going to convolve with, you know, h of n minus k. And what I get here is h k times z to the n minus k. And for the same reason as before, I can factor out that um, the, the z to the n. And so I get z to the n over here times the sum of h of k z to the minus k. And that's equal to h of z here. And we'll see later that this is the z transform of the, the impulse response. So that we're going to see that um, in a, one of the lectures towards the end of the class. So the output is simply z to the n times this h of z here. So if you're given a LTI system, and you're asked to do a convolution with something that looks like z to the n, then you can possibly do that convolution much more easily by computing this summation and plugging in for the value of z. Now, I'm not guaranteeing it'll be easy. I'm sure there'll be sometimes cases where it's actually harder, but this is um, the property here. Now, let's look at um, linear time invariant system described by linear constant coefficient difference equation. Now here, suppose that x of n is equal to z to the n. Well, if that's the case, if I plug in n minus 1, then the factor, so that's x of n minus 1 is equal to z to the n times z to the minus 1. But this looks just like a delayed version of x of n here. And so for the same reasons as before, if his LTI, y of n is equal to h of z times z to the n, we insert into the difference equation exactly this property here. So everywhere we see a delay, we're going to replace that delay with a z of the form of this here. And then we plug that in. Using the same logic as before, we get h of z times z to the n and a sum over ak z to the minus k, which is equal to zn, the sum over bk z to the minus k, and so then again, canceling out the common z to the n, both sides. We're left with h of z, and we move this over here from this side. We put it over here. We get this formula here. So if you have a, a linear constant coefficient difference equation, you can easily compute the response to a complex uh, sinusoid here, or this complex z to the n here, by um, computing 
this ratio between these two polynomials here and plugging in for the value of z. So let's go up here, back to review here. So the output, if we put an input out of z of the n, the output is h of z times z to the n. And if it's LTI and we have the impulse response, we can compute h of z from this formula. And if it is described by a linear constant coefficient difference equation, we can compute it by this formula here. Or you could um, take your linear constant coefficient difference equation, you could compute the impulse response and then apply the previous formula, but this is usually easier to start directly from here. Okay, now one thing I want to again make clear that the exponentials that we're talking about here that are eigenfunctions are doubly infinite. So notice that there was no unit step function at all. So there's u of t and u of n here. So the, um, a lot of the problems that we solve have these unit steps here. And unfortunately, you can't really simplify in that case here. All right. Now I see someone has raised their hand. Let me see if I can figure out how to answer that here. OK, let's see. Hmm. Uh, what happened? Someone have a question? It somehow went away. Where did it go? Uh, uh, anyone says, sorry, did someone have a question here? Because I can't see the uh, person who had a question here. Hmm. Okay. By the way, just for reference, I can also see the chat window, so you might not want to type irrelevant things in there. He's just making me hungry. OK, um, now let's look at this cautionary note here that, um, yeah, so causal exponential functions do not have the same behavior here. So let's keep going now. OK, so I wanted to pause here for a second and explain a little bit that um, you know, this whole concept of eigenfunction is actually something that you've seen before already in linear algebra class. So linear algebra, hopefully you remember that there was this concept of an eigenvector and an eigenvalue. So if you have a matrix A of x, an eigenvector is a vector that, when multiplied by the matrix A of x, gives you lambda times x. And x, the, all the x's that satisfy this property are called eigenvectors, and the lambdas associated with them are called eigenvalues. And it turns out that this is a, a very simple form of a, um, a linear transformation, and it, it's actually very much related to the, the, uh, the concept of an LTI system here. So in our case, the system's impulse response plays the role of the matrix. And instead of having an eigenvector, we have a function. And instead of having eigenvalue, we have a function. But otherwise, it's, you know, it's a similar concept here. Now, another thing that I wanted to mention is that you know, this is also widely used. I mean, in terms of um, you know, signal processing communications, these notions of eigenvectors and eigenvalues are used all over the place, especially in um, signal processing problems involving uh, data mining, machine learning. They're also used in um, this problem here, which I got from the web page below, which is on face recognition. And so um, this is basically a, a data mining type problem. So what happens is, you, you know, suppose you're building a system so that, you know, Let's, let's say that we want to build a system to let anyone from the 313 class into the UTA building where my office is. And there's you know, 65 people in the class. Now, you might think that the best way to do this is you, know, you take everybody's picture, and then you look at the, um, you know, someone, walks, someone walks in, there's a video, uh, you know, camera takes their picture, and then you just compare it with all the pictures. 
Now, you, you could do that, but what it turns out to be is more efficient is something like the following here. And, and the reason this is more efficient is that, you know, people's photos are taken in different positions, different lighting conditions, um, different orientations. You might have your head tilted. You might be looking up. Um, and, and so a powerful way is to use this, this eigenface notion where you actually, in a very similar way as this, this matrix equation, you use these faces here to build up a set of eigenfaces. And the eigenfaces play the role of the eigenvectors. And so then when a new face comes, you figure out, you write that, you basically imagine that face as a linear combination of eigenfaces. And then that linear combination will help you determine who it actually was. So that's basically the idea um, of eigenfaces. Uh, and if you take uh, one of the image and video classes, um, that you could take you know, after this course, then you might explore some of those concepts in, in more detail here. But I just wanted to, to emphasize here that you know, this notions of eigenvector, eigenvalue, I mean, they have wide applications throughout signal processing. All right, so I'll pause here to see if someone wants to try to ask a question again, um, and I can see how to answer it. I think what I can do is if someone has a question, I can pass the microphone to them and then they can ask it, or you can type a question. All right, someone is typing here. That's a good sign. Hopefully this does not relate to breakfast sausage. Doubly infinite here. OK, that's the question. Let me go back here. Um, doubly infinite just means it goes from, let me see if I can type here, it goes from minus infinity. Well, I can't write the infinity sign. to infinity here. Because like if you look here at the these unit step functions, they go from minus infinity to infinity, but they're zero up at up until point zero. So they look like um, these functions here look like this. You know, and then there's a transition and then there's maybe some decay. Wow, this drawing is really horrible here. Whereas in the other case, you know, they would just be existing in continuous all the way. So that's what I meant there. Like most of the examples of functions we've dealt with so far had that unit step attached to them. But we did some examples where they didn't have the unit step. All right, now let's keep going here. So let's, let's look at some examples of um, how this whole thing works. So what if I have a constant? You know, I have an LTI system and I just put in a constant number. Well, um, you can go through and do the convolution, or you could realize that, ah, a constant is just c times 1 to the n. And so this is actually an exponential function. So if I can compute the system response, all I have to do is evaluate it at 1. So the output y of n is just the system response evaluated at 1 times that input constant. Now, let's look at a second example here. So suppose I put in a sinusoid, like a cosine. So say I put in cosine of omega n. Well, um, we haven't said anything about the cosine. But we know we can use Euler's identity to write the cosine as a function of uh, exponentials. And in this case, we can write the cosine as 1 half e to the j omega n plus e to the minus j omega n. So this e to the j omega right here, it plays the role of the z. And so then we can plug that in our system response, and then the output is simply 1 half h of e to the j omega times e to the j omega n plus 1 half h e to the minus j omega times e to the j omega n. And sometimes you can simplify this even further. Uh, that we'll see actually a bit later in the course here. But basically, um, the, the main message here, and this also applies in continuous time, is that sinusoids, um, are, which are a special case of complex exponentials, are also eigenfunctions of LTI systems. 
So anytime you have a problem involving sines, sum of sines, sum of cosines, you can compute the output of the LTI of the L, an LTI system with an input of a sine or a cosine. So that's very um, useful fact to know. Simplifies um, calculations. Of course, you have to get the h of you know z in the first place here. Now let's let me go through just the example of how to calculate the uh, response for a linear constant coefficient differential equation. So suppose that you had the linear constant coefficient differential equation described by the following system. So this is um, dy dt plus 1 half y of t equals x of t. And we want to find the response to x of t equals e to the 3t. Well, here what we do is we use that formula on the previous slide to compute that h of s is equal to 1 divided by 1 half plus s or equivalently 2 over 2s, 1, 2 over 1 plus 2s. And then now what I do is I want to find the output for e to the 3t is I plug in 3 here. So I get 2 divided by 1 plus 2 times 3 e to the 3t or 2 sevenths e to the 3t. So we see that, you know, the first step here is computing h of s. And then the second step is evaluating h of s at the value of the exponential that we were looking at here. And that gives us the eigenvalue. OK, so that's it for um, eigenfunctions. Uh, any, any questions on eigenfunctions? All right, I don't see any questions, so we'll keep going here. OK, so the second topic today is the continuous time Fourier series. So what you want to do here is be able to explain the key idea of the Fourier series and then its specialization to real signals. So we're going to focus in this class and the next couple of classes on you know, Fourier series or continuous time signals. Um, we actually, I don't think we will deal with Fourier series for discrete time signals, periodic signals. Uh, that's something that's covered in more detail in uh, 351M. So consider a periodic signal x of t with period t. So that x of t is um, the t that satisfies x of t plus large t is equal to x of t. And remember, the period is the smallest positive non-zero such t. So the Fourier series representation of a periodic signal is as follows here. Basically, it's a way of writing a periodic signal x of t as a sum of complex exponentials, in particular complex sinusoids, with value e to the j, k, omega naught t, where omega naught is the fundamental frequency, which is just 2 pi over t. And the coefficients a, k here are called the Fourier series coefficients of the signal x of t. And then a, k in particular is the kth harmonic component of a of t, and a0 is the dc value. So what the Fourier series says is that you can decompose a periodic signal as a sum of complex sinusoids. And um, we'll, get, we'll discuss a bit how to calculate those uh, coefficients a little bit later here. But this is, this is the key definition here. So now let's, let's explore this in a bit more detail here. So basically what I'm saying is that if you have a periodic signal, and what I mean here by most is that this concept applies to almost all periodic signals except for some very strange ones. And those strange ones uh, don't satisfy certain properties that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Um, practically speaking, this works for all, all signals except for some, some that you know mathematicians can come up with that are really strange. Uh, and so if, if I write out that summation, I mean essentially what I'm saying is that my periodic signal can be written as a a constant term, which is a DC offset, plus some 
a linear combination of e to the j omega t and e to the minus j omega t plus a linear combination of e to the j 2 omega t, e to the minus j 2 omega t, and so on. So that's basically what the Fourier series is saying, and you know it just continues on here. Now let's, let's just as a sanity check, indeed confirm that this is periodic. Well, checking the periodicity, so let's look at x of t plus capital T. So we plug that in, we get e to, j, e to the j k omega little t plus capital T. And using the same thing, we've used this, I think, three times in the lecture already. Same when we talk about eigenfunctions. You know, we have the e to the j k omega t plus capital T is just e to the j k omega t times e to the j k omega capital T. And look what this is here. e to the j k capital omega t, if you remember back over here, omega is 2 pi over t. So if I multiply 2 pi over t by t, I get 2 pi. And e to the j 2 pi times any integer is just 1. So this goes away. Right? And that goes away. And what I'm left with is e to the sum for minus infinity to infinity, a k e to j k omega t, which is actually just what we started with here. So this is just to confirm the periodicity of the Fourier series. OK, so now let's um, see how this works here. If I can actually share um, a website here. Give me one second here. I'm going to try this out. There's um, a pretty good chance this actually won't work at all. Um, but let me try it anyway here. Okay, I'm just looking up the uh, website URL. Wishing I had actually typed it differently here. Fourier graph applet.php. Okay, now I'm going to see if I can actually share this here. So I'm going to do a quick stop sharing. Then I'm going to click share my screen. Or not. It's not working here. Let's see. Privacy. Okay, one second here. Had some problem with my computer. Okay, now I'm going to do this again. Share my share document. No. Share your screen. Yeah, here we go. Um, where did it go? Mission Finder Firefox. Firefox. Okay. All right. I'm sharing Firefox here, one would hope. Let's see. Uh, let me just put this over here. OK. Can someone tell me if they can see my Firefox screen here? As I can't see it. Cannot see it. Can you see it now? No, cannot see it. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay. 
All right. Now, how about now? Can you see my screen here? Okay. All right. Well, I, it may not be um, a great size here, but hopefully you can um, you can see it here. Whoops. Sorry. Let me get out of this here. Okay. All right. Now, um, what we're going to do is, so this is an example, and I encourage you to actually go back and play with this applet later in your own time, you know, during the weekend when you're looking for something to do besides the homework. You can play with this um, little application here. So we're going to look first at um, a, a square wave here. And this square wave, um, you'll see it in a second here, but uh, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to go through here, and um, we're going to start by adding terms in the Fourier series expression. And as we keep adding sinusoids together, eventually this starts flattening out and looking here like a square wave here. Now let's look at the uh, sawtooth wave here. So here we add sinusoids, 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 more sinusoids. And as we keep adding them, you start to see this sawtooth waveform here. And so this is just giving some intuition that, you know, and if you look here, you see the phase shifts here of these peaks. So we're actually adding, you know, different sinusoids here um, yeah, as we keep going here. Uh, let's look at this cosine blip here. I don't remember what a cosine blip is. No, that's another strange signal. But um, anyways, so this is essentially the idea. You know, we add, keep adding terms, and then um, if you add enough terms, then you get back effectively the original signal here. Now, this is a classic example because if you see on the screen, there's a little blip right here, and that little blip gets narrower and narrower, but actually doesn't go away. And that's something called the Gibbs phenomena. And we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. But um, basically, this um, this is a slight. This is due to the discontinuity in the square wave. Okay, so let's go now to um, let's see back to. This application sharing, share my document. Okay. All right, so now we're back in the document here. Okay, so now let's look at the special case of real signals. So a real signal is one where the, um, the conjugate of that signal is equal to the signal itself because it's real, right? So this means there's no imaginary part. So let's look at the Fourier transform of that signal, the, sorry, the Fourier series of that signal, and let's take the, its conjugate. So if we take its conjugate, we get the conjugate of the sum from minus infinity to infinity, A of K, E to J, K omega T. And then the conjugate of a sum is the sum of the conjugates. And then we have a product of two complex numbers. The conjugate of the product of two complex numbers is just um, the conjugate of each of those numbers multiplied together. So this is a star k times e to the minus j k omega t. Now, what we observe here, so going um, from the bottom here over here, so I'm going to change variables. I'm going to replace k with minus l. And I'm summing from k minus infinity to infinity, so that's also like summing from l minus infinity to infinity. And through the change of variables, I see that I can rewrite this as the sum from l a star minus l e to the j k l omega naught t. But from the original definition of the Fourier series, this is a k star e to the j k omega t. Which is just equal to a k e to the j k omega naught t. So what we conclude in all of this here is that um, 
the Fourier series coefficients corresponding to the negative frequencies x of k, a sub k, are just the conjugates of the Fourier series frequencies at the values of k. So again, so this is the special symmetry of real signals. So for a complex signal, the Fourier series coefficients for a given frequency, if you compare the positive and the negative frequency, they don't have to be the same. But for real signals, they're not the same, but one is the conjugate of the other. Right? So A0 is, is itself. A1 is the conjugate of A minus 1. A2 is the conjugate of A minus 2, and so on. And because of that symmetry, we can rewrite the Fourier series in a slightly different way. So because it's real, we're going to rewrite this sum. And we're going to pull out the A0 term. I'm going to write the sum from 1 to infinity. And I get AK e to the JK omega naught t plus A minus K e to the minus JK omega naught t. But because of the previous slide, a to the minus k is just a conjugate of k here. So this goes from here to here. And then now we see that, ah, this is a complex number, and this is the complex conjugate of a complex number. So if I have a complex number plus this complex conjugate, I get twice the real part, and the imaginary part goes away. And so this is equal to a0 plus the sum of 2 times the real of ak e to the jk omega naught t. Now, to simplify further, we're going to look at a couple special cases. So first of all, let's suppose that the um, ak is equal is written in polar form here. That's, of course, a polar bear. And ak is then the sum of from 1 to infinity, 2 real times a k e to the j k omega naught t plus theta k, theta k coming from over here. And then the real part of a, a k is real, so we can factor that out. And the real part of a complex sinusoid is just the cosine, so by Euler's identity. So that we can rewrite this as a naught plus 2 times the sum from k 1 to infinity, a k cosine k omega t plus theta of k. So basically, we can rewrite the real signals as the sum of phase shifted cosines and a DC term. Right? So any real periodic signal, or at least almost all real periodic signals, can be written as the sum of a constant plus cosines at multiples of the fundamental period with phase offsets. So this is the Fourier series coefficients now are split up. This is the magnitude, and this is the phase of the kth coefficient. Now let's keep going here. So in Cartesian form, let's let ak equal bk plus j c of k. All right. Um, uh, I have a question here. Let me see how I can address that here. Let's see. Enable microphone. Okay. All right. Do you have a... I'll... Yeah, you can either type your question or I can get the... Okay, good. Where do you get the phase offset values? Well, this is a complex number. So uh, you just write it in polar notation. Polar notation is where you write a complex number as a magnitude times e to the j of this theta. So, I mean, the actual formula for it comes from, I think we did it on in lecture one or lecture two. But you have to find the, the AKs first. And we haven't discussed how to find the AKs yet. That's the last part of the lecture. All right, just one more question here. Okay. All right. Now, um, so supposing that AK is a is also a complex number. Now we rewrite it in Cartesian form as a real plus J times the imaginary. We can go through and plug in in the same way here. And so we get BK plus JCK times. Now we're going to plug in for the complex 
sinusoid here, cosine plus j sine. This is Euler's identity. And then we have the product of these two complex numbers. So it's going to be, you know, bk cos minus ck sine plus the imaginary part, but we're taking the real, so we don't care about the imaginary part. So all we're left with is this. So what this says is that we can also write a real periodic signal as a sum of cosines and sines and a scalar. And the coefficients of the Fourier series, the AKs, are related to the BK and the CK just in this Cartesian form here. So these are just two different ways of writing this here. So basically what this says is that the so periodic signals can be written as a sum of complex sinusoids. And of course you can decompose the complex sinusoid into a cosine and a sine. And for real signals, you can specialize it further and rewrite the periodic signal as a sum of cosines with phase shifts or as a sum of sine and cosine. And then you have a DC term in all the cases. All right, so now um, a quick example here. Now, originally I was going to do this example um, by hand, but uh, I did not plug in my document camera. So we're going to try this here. Just I'll, I'll just do it on the slide here. Um, suppose you have a periodic real signal with a period of 8, and it has two non-zero Fourier series coefficients a1 and a-1, which are 2, and a3 and a-3 star, which is 4j. And so express x of t in both polar and Cartesian form. Well, let me see here. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the solution written here. Hmm. All right, sorry. Let's get this one here. Hmm. Yeah, I'll try to write up the solution and post it on Canvas. Okay, all right, so let me summarize here that a periodic signal can be written as a sum, complex exponentials, omega naught, which is 2 pi over t, is the fundamental frequency. And there's a special form of the signals when they're real as either cosine with phase shifts or a cosine and a sine. Now, of course, the one thing that we're missing here is where do we get the AK? Where does this coefficient come from here, right? I mean, I just sort of assumed it was given, but, but how do we get it? That's the subject of the last part of the lecture, which is finding the Fourier series coefficients. So you should be able to find these coefficients and explain how you find them. All right, so let's look at this here. So um, uh, first of all, I'm going to explain, I'm going to give you the formula for finding the coefficients, and then we're going to go through and discuss, you know, why that's, that formula makes sense. So the Fourier series coefficients are computed from the integral over one period. So this t right here, right, let me just put this over, write this over here. This is just over, over any one period. So you can have this, you know, over the first period, the second period, any period you want. And AK is, you normalize, you normalize by K, the integral between X of K and E to the minus J K omega naught T dt. Now, you hopefully also remember from linear algebra this concept of an inner product. So an inner product between two vectors, X and Y, which we also write as the dot product, is just the sum of x1 times y1 conjugate plus x2 times y2 conjugate and so on. And that's just the sum of x1, y, i, j. So the inner product is, is a way of measuring how similar two vectors are. You know, so if two vectors are on top of each other, then um, their inner product is large. And if two vectors are orthogonal, their inner product is zero. So it turns out that this integral up here is also related to um, an inner product on Hilbert space, which looks something like follows here. So it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar here. 
And so on the space of functions that are square integrable, this function here plays the role of an inner product. Now this is for not periodic functions. Um, I should have emphasized this for periodic functions. But basically, what's happening here is that the kth coefficient, what we do is we ask the question, how similar is x to e to the j k omega t at frequency k times omega? So that's the key thing here, is that the a k, the strength of the a k is related to how much of the frequency component e to the j k omega naught t is in there. Right, so a zero is the constant here, so that's just the average value of x of t. A1 is how much e to the minus j omega naught t is in there. A100 is how much of e to the minus j 100 omega naught t is in there. So it's a, it's a representation of the strength of a particular frequency contribution. Now, I just presented that equation to you, so you may, you know, be suspicious. Um, if you haven't seen it before, of course, it's a crazy looking equation. So let's plug it back in and see what happens. Well, I'm going to integrate from 0 to t, x of t, e to the minus j, omega, n of t. But, hey, I know that x of t is periodic, and it can be written as a Fourier series. And I'm going to write the Fourier series coefficients as k from minus infinity to infinity, a of k, e to the j, k, omega, naught t e to the minus j n omega t dt. And then the key thing here is I'm going to, um, whoops, I'm going to switch the order of integration and summation. And then um, a k is a constant here, so I can factor it out. It doesn't depend on the, the t in the integral. And so I get the integral from 0 to t, e to the j, k minus n, omega naught of t dt. So the one cautionary thing I want to say here is that um, you have to be careful when switching the order of integration and summation. And I say this because, you know, if you're integrating something that integrates to infinity, and then you try to sum it, um, it's infinity, so you can't switch it. And th this is actually the reason that the Fourier series doesn't quite represent every signal, but we'll, it, it's a technical detail that we'll discuss in the next lecture. But for now, the main thing to note is that this inner product here, when I plug back in the Fourier series, depends on this quantity right here. In particular, the integral from 0 to t of e to the j k minus n omega naught t. So now we have to say, what does that look like? Sorry, I had a, another message here. Um, so let's let's look at a visual interpretation of this. So again, what I'm doing is I'm plotting the um, I'm plotting this e to the j k minus n omega naught t. So I'm plotting the um, this is actually the real part of it. So if we have zero omega the area is t. If I have omega 0, here look, so this is a cosine. So, and I'm integrating over one period, right? So if I integrate over one period, the part above the 0 is the same area as the part below the period. So if you integrate a, a cosine over one frequency, it integrates to 0. If you integrate three times that fundamental frequency, you get three periods it integrates to zero. You integrate two times the fundamental frequency, you get two periods, it integrates to zero. So the only time it doesn't integrate to zero is the case where the, you have a cosine of, of zero, which is just one. Now, um, let's look at this here. So this leads to what's called the orthogonality principle. So by the same logic here, so basically, if I integrate this here, I can split it up as the integral of the cosine plus j times the sine. Now the sine of 0 is 0. 
And by the same logic as the previous slide, this quantity here is always zero. So that's always zero, so it disappears. And so the cosine, what we saw on the previous slide is that that integral is going to be t here at zero, and otherwise at zero. So basically, this whole thing integrates out to either t or zero. And this is important. This is called the orthogonality principle. Right? And what it basically says is that the sinusoids, e to the j, k omega naught of t, are orthogonal to each other. And what that means is that the inner product that we've defined in terms of this integral here, it integrates to zero if those sinusoids are zero, are different. And then if they're the same, it integrates to one. And so therefore, whoops, sorry, this uh, didn't draw very well here. Delete that. And so in conclusion, when we integrate x of t with e to the minus j omega naught of t, we get out a of n here. There's an n here and an n here. And this comes because of the orthogonality. So this um, result right here, this is actually something, if you take further signal processing classes, that you'll use quite a bit. You use this a lot in 445S and 351M. You use this in DSP, advanced DSP, um, the graduate level DSP. Um, it's, it's, it's used quite a bit here. And this is called an orthogonality principle. And it's basically just, we're just saying that these two functions are orthogonal in some sense. And specifically, if I integrate over one period because they're periodic, then these guys are orthogonal. And it's orthogonal exactly in the same way that um, two vectors that are orthogonal have an inner product of zero. All right, um, this is an important concept. I want to stop here, see if there's any questions before we finish up. Okay, no questions. I think everyone is also watching YouTube while they're watching my video. Okay, now, so given that here, this leads us to what's called the Fourier series analysis equations. So basically that, to get the Fourier series coefficients A of n, what I need to do is integrate x of t with e to the minus j n omega naught of t dt and divide by the period. So the a nth contribution is just the, um, is the amount of signal that um, is basically parallel to that frequency. And you can also write it like this here, just plugging in for omega here. And then the Fourier synthesis equations is rewriting x of k as the sum of complex sinusoids. You can write that equivalently as a function of capital T here. Now, um, notice here, I've highlighted these terms in different colors. So basically, the analysis term, the analysis equations, what we're, what we're doing is we're analyzing the signal and looking at its frequency content. And so analysis means getting the frequency content here. And synthesis means we're building a signal from a bunch of frequencies. So, so for synthesis, think synthesizer, the instrument that you can play you know, generate sounds. An analysis would be, you know, trying to figure out what sounds are actually being played from the signal, what notes. And, um, sorry, I don't know why that's here. I should get rid of that. Okay, so the lecture actually concludes with a rather lengthy example, so let me go through it here. So we have a periodic function. This is a square wave function. So it goes from minus one-half to one-half, and then it's zero. So this thing is periodic with period of t. And the rectangle is one unit wide, where one is, you know, potentially less than t here. So you can see it's periodic, and it's a square wave. So let's look at the Fourier series coefficients. So the start at the top here, um, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate over one period. So I'm going to integrate from minus t over 2 to t. Why? Because I integrate from minus t over 2 to t here, then I'm just going to be left with one integral piece here. I could also integrate from 0 to t, but then I'd be left with two pieces of an integral, one here and one here. So that's why I'm integrating from minus t to t, t over 2 to t over 2. So I plug in the formula here with omega naught equals 2 pi over t. And I integrate x of t. So in that range, this is just the signal value is 1 from minus 1 half to 1 half. And so then using the integral of the exponential function, that's minus 1 over j k omega naught t, e to the minus j k omega naught t from minus 1 half to 1 half. Then plugging in, I get that same constant times e to the j k omega naught over t over 2 minus e to the minus j omega naught k over 2. Now here, um, this is a slightly tricky thing here. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to see how I have a j here. I'm going to factor that j. I'm just putting that j over here. And I'm going to multiply and divide by 2. So I have a 1 over 2j here. And by doing this, this quantity here becomes a sign. And so that becomes 2k omega naught t times the sine of k omega naught t, omega naught, omega naught over 2. Now, I can further write this as a function of sine of k omega naught over 2 divided by k omega naught over 2. And you might think, why are we doing this? But that function is very common in signal processing. It actually has its own name. It's called the sinc function, S-I-N-C, sinc. Sinc function is the name of the sine of x over x. And so I can rewrite that as 1 over t sinc of k omega naught over 2. Now, there's a little problem here, which is what happens at k equals 0? Because for k equals 0, I get the sinc of 0, which is sine of 0 over 0, which is 0 over 0. Oops. Well, what happened? Well, first of all, if we actually did the integral with k equals 0, we would just have 1 over t integral from minus 1 half to 1 half x of t dt, which is just 1 half, 1 over 2, 1 half minus minus 1 half is equal to 1 over t. Now, um, it turns out that, in fact, this isn't a problem because it is known that if you look at the sine function, the sinc function, and you take the limit of this function as k goes to 0, and you use L'Hopital's rule, which I tried to use on one earlier quiz incorrectly, but here it's correct, and evaluate that, it turns out you get 1 over t. So in fact, the sinc function um, actually does work out here. And so you get, you know, here you get basically 1 over t. And so therefore, ak is equal to the sine of k omega naught over 2, k times pi. Now let me make sure I got that correct here. So k... Uh, yeah, which is 1 over t times the sink of this quantity here. And then this and then the sink um where did the 1 over t go away from here? Sorry. Um yeah, this is equal to omega naught over 2 pi, which is 1 over t. And so this should be um, k pi, let me look here, 1 over t. Sorry, I forgot the, um, no, that one over there. This should be 1 over t sync. Oh, yeah, we have the um, t over t. Sorry, I think I forgot the, I forgot the 1 over t here. And the two, yeah, sorry, there's something missing. Um, yeah, I'm missing one, one thing here, but basically th this is, I think, besides a constant, this should be correct here. I'm missing constant here. I need to check that here. I think it's correct.
well, let's look at some, um, yeah, some of the values here, assuming that I did that correctly here. So we got like 1 over t, minus 1 over pi, or 1 over pi, 0, minus 1 over 3 pi, 0, 1 over 5 pi, and so on. So it turns out that the, um, sorry, it's not quite right here, but basically the Fourier coefficients are 0 for even coefficients, even integers, and non-zero for odd integers with the following formula here. And so if we plot that, what we see is something that looks like this here. So these are the Fourier series coefficients. Notice I've plotted k down here, and this is a k. Now one thing to note is that I, I did this deliberately as a stem plot, so that you see that you know the Fourier series coefficients are like discrete time signal themselves. And these are the coefficients of our signal here. And it's all, um, all the coefficients in this case happen to be real. Though a lot of times you're going to find them where they're complex and conjugates of each other. But that's the basic idea here. So, sorry, let me go back and just summarize this here. So to compute the Fourier series coefficients, you have to integrate the signal. You have to basically compute this integral here. And so, you know, that in some cases, we'll have a few of these on the homework. They'll be a little bit tedious, but you have to go through and integrate them to come up with an expression for the coefficients that looks ideally something elegant like this. That's it. All right, so to summarize, um, eigenfunctions of LTI systems. So an eigenfunction is basically a function that goes in and also comes out, basically untouched, except for a, a gain and phase shift. The Fourier series, it's a way of representing periodic signals as a sum of complex sinusoids, and it has a functional form for real signals, which is a function of cosines or uh, sines and cosines. And then to find the Fourier series coefficients, we use this notion of orthogonality of complex exponentials. And then you should be able to derive and use both the analysis and synthesis equations. So sometimes you'll be given the Fourier series coefficients, and you'll have to compute the periodic signal. And other times, you'll be given a periodic signal that you have to compute the Fourier series coefficients for it. Now, in the next lecture, we're also going to talk about Fourier series of, um, we're going to look at some of the technical issues related to calculating the Fourier series coefficients, um, the few cases where they don't exist. And then we are going to, um, look at this and use the Fourier series as a springboard for representing signals that are not periodic as a sum of complex sinusoids. So that's basically where we're going. And this is getting into, you know, an important part of signals and systems, which is frequency domain analysis and Fourier theory. It's one of the reasons that, um, you know, we're going we're to talk about the Fourier transform um, for the many lectures in the rest of the class here. All right, so that's it. Um, there's a couple people remaining. Anyone online have any questions?